I'd like to welcome you to the um, Security Foundation's Education Breakfast. And at this time, it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker for today's program, Dr. Taran Segal. Dr. Segal is a physician of Brigham and Women's Department of Neurology and is the new medical director of Sturdy's Multiple Cirrhosis Center. Dr. Segal is board certified in neurology. He received his medical degree from the All India Institute of Medical Science in Delhi, and he completed his advanced neurology fellowship at Mass General and fulfilled his residency training at Brigham and Women's Hospital in Mass General. Dr. Segal was recently appointed to the Harvard Medical School as an instructor. And this morning, he's to speak about a wide range of services that the MS Center here offers. So with no further ado, Dr. Segal. Thank you very much for your kind introduction. And it's a privilege to be here. Thank you all for coming today. I look forward to working with you in the months and years to come. Uh, so I'm going to talk about uh, multiple sclerosis in general, just give a brief outline about the disease itself. The facilities at the Sturdy, Memorial, uh, Sturdy uh, Multiple Sclerosis Center and uh, how to access the Sturdy MS Clinic. Uh, also how we are involved in patient education in addition to uh, patient care. And what are our future plans for the facility? So what is multiple sclerosis? Multiple sclerosis essentially is a disease of the brain and the spinal cord. And brain, as you know, is essentially who we are. And spinal cord is the connection between the brain and the rest of the body. So multiple sclerosis is caused by an attack of the immune system on the brain and the spinal cord. The immune system, which is supposed to basically protect us from infections in multiple sclerosis, turns against us and tends to affect particular, aspect, particular parts of the brain and spinal cord. It affects the nerve cells, and nerve cells have this structure where they have a cell body, which is the control center of the cell, and this axon, which is like a cable that transmits the information from this control center to the rest of the body, and also does it in the opposite direction, depending on the type of the cell. Now, this cord, or this cable, has an insulation around it, which is also known as myelin. It is this insulation, or this myelin sheath, is what is affected in MS by these immune cells. And what happens is that these, this myelin sheet, which is normally encircling the cable or the axon, gets damaged and the axon becomes exposed. And this leads to an impairment of nerve conduction. So all the information that needs to be sent either to or from the brain is not conducted in the right way in patients with multiple sclerosis. And if you look at brain sections, it literally creates holes in the portion of the brain which has those cables, which are known as plaques. Brain tries to uh, repair mm -hmm. them, and these areas where you see these uh, white, uh, uh, white, white lesions, uh, they tend to become uh, more remyelinated or get their insulation back a little bit, but still not like the normal blue staining that you see for a normal uh, white matter or the, the part where the cables or the axons run. So essentially, multiple sclerosis is a disease that affects the connections between the brain and the rest of the body. So you can imagine how it affects a patient. Uh, the brain is responsible for most of the functions that we identify with ourselves, including our vision. So. We have the nerve cells conducting the information about uh, our surroundings, the visual information to the brain. And if those nerves are affected, patients present with vision changes. They can have decreased vision. They can have double vision. Patients may have numbness or weakness or imbalance. Again, this is due to impairment of transmission of information either to or from the brain. And that is due to the, uh, the influence of the disease on the spinal cord or the brain itself. In MS, patients also have cognitive changes because again, for thinking, the brain cells have to communicate with each other. So MS, 
doesn't just affect your vision, your motor system, your uh, sensory system, but also affects the higher mental functions. And patients have a lot of cognitive changes. A lot of patients have fatigue, which is a very common uh, symptom that patients experience. And that is due to chemical imbalance that is caused by the damage of the disease to these various nerve cells. And patients often have a lot of pain and spasticity, which is again due to impaired control of the central nervous system over the rest of the body. MS is fairly common, especially in this part of the world. Uh, as you grow further from the equator in both directions, north and south, it tends to become more common. The risk of developing MS in our community here is one in 750. A rough number could be one in 1,000. And it's three times more common in women than in men. And the reason for that is not completely clear, but it has definitely a lot to do with the hormonal influences of progesterone and estrogen on the immune system and the nerve cells. The typical age of onset of multiple sclerosis is between 20 and 40 years. So it affects the young adult population during their most productive years but it can present across the lifespan. In the United States alone, it affects 350 to 400,000 individuals. So if we say that the population is 300 million and one in 1,000, so that comes about to this number, which is also empirically derived. And worldwide, you see that about 2.5 million individuals are affected. So it's a fairly common problem, and the fact that it affects people in their young adulthood makes it uh, even worse. So how do we make a diagnosis of MS? It's based on a combination of clinical features and imaging findings, uh, basically MRI findings, magnetic resonance imaging. So I just mentioned to you that MS is basically an interaction between the nervous system and the immune system. And this interaction that led to the various, that leads to the various changes that I just showed you, leads to certain shadows on the MRI in a certain pattern, which when recognized, help us make the diagnosis of MS. The only problem with this is that some of these findings are not specific and they can occur in other conditions as well. And that leads to a lot of confusion about whether a patient has MS or not. Because if you look at these so-called white spots, this, uh, in this particular case, they are in a particular distribution that suggests that this is MS. But if they are in another distribution, let's say they are more in the central part here, then they may be due to other reasons as well. And when patients get uh, their MRI scans read or uh, looked at by a number of uh, providers, there can be some confusion about whether this is due to MS or due to another cause. For example, chronic ischemia in a patient with, let's say, chronic diabetes can lead to white spots in the brain, but that is not MS. And that leads to a lot of confusion and anxiety among patients, but that is what our job is, to help make the correct diagnosis based on the MRI findings and patient symptoms. If left untreated, MS tends to progress over the years. There is an increased burden of disability as time progresses. There are increased changes on MRI, both chronic as well as acute changes. Over time, there may even be shrinkage of the brain itself, and there is a loss of cognitive function. In physical terms, uh, while initially a patient may have normal neurological examination, but over a period of time, especially if left untreated, can lead to significant disability uh, and lead to a requirement of a, a cane for ambulation or wheelchair or being bed bound in advanced cases if left untreated. So uh, the Multiple Sclerosis Center at Sturdy Memorial Hospital, our aim is to provide specialized and coordinated care to patients with multiple sclerosis. And the goal is to minimize the impact of the disease and to maximize each individual's physical and emotional well-being. And for that, the center has adopted a multidisciplinary approach, which I think is a very comprehensive approach. Uh, this is a center where there is a team of neurologists, nurses, physical, occupational, and speech therapists, and social workers all under the same roof and available to the patient at the same time 
for a comprehensive care of their problems associated with multiple sclerosis. As you can imagine, management of multiple sclerosis is complex. This includes treatment of acute exacerbations of the symptoms, management of symptoms in general chronically. Disease modification is key and central to management of multiple sclerosis, where we want to prevent the occurrence of these exacerbations or these relapses, and also want to prevent a disability progression. And also, we want to provide support to family and, and the patient. There are now about, there are actually now 10 drugs available to help with MS disease modification that tend to uh, prevent relapses and also prevent disease progression. And they may include, oh, excuse me, they may include injectables, pills, or infusions. And the, the, the territory is very complex for a patient to navigate. And our goal here is to help them identify the best medicine for their particular disease and use it effectively and safely. Various drugs have different efficacies, different side effect profiles, and that's what makes it even more complex. In addition to managing the core disease itself, the, the immunology uh, of the disease itself, the management of symptoms associated with multiple sclerosis is, equal, is equally or even more complex. And these various symptoms include, as I mentioned earlier, spasticity, pain, fatigue, depression, cognitive dysfunction, etc. And all of them require, again, a, a complex team-based approach for their management. So in terms of the services offered at the Sturdy uh, Multiple Sclerosis Clinic, we offer this entire range of medical management of multiple sclerosis and, and related symptoms. Uh, we have facility to manage the uh, medication pumps for pain and spasticity. Also uh, provide uh, botulinum injections for advanced cases of headaches and spasticity. Infusion therapies including steroids and biologicals for the wide range of uh, 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 pharmacological options that are available for these patients. Nursing services, physical therapy, occupational therapy, social services, and speech and language evaluations. I have worked at a few hospitals now, uh, and I am really uh, quite impressed by the, 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 you know, the range of facilities that are available for patients here under one roof. And uh, patients do not have to visit, make multiple visits to different providers uh, for these things. So it is really uh, very uh, impressive. And I feel I'm very privileged to be working here uh, with the rest of the team. So, uh, and we also offer individual physical therapy exercise programs and referrals for outpatient physical therapy. In terms of future plans, we obviously want to expand and consolidate uh, the existing services, but we also want to get involved in advanced cutting edge research. Uh, with this association with Brigham and Women's Hospital, uh, we will have access for our patients here at Sturdy to various clinical trials, biomarker studies, imaging studies, uh, which are being run at uh, that institution and its other uh, associates. For example, uh, one of the forms of multiple sclerosis is progressive multiple sclerosis, for which there is no uh, very uh, well-defined treatment. But there are uh, several good clinical trials that are being run right now at Brigham and Women's, for example, uh, which they are very excited to associate with sturdy um, um, you know, Memorial Hospital and, and have patients uh, the access to that option. So this is a very exciting part of what uh, we will be trying to do in the next, uh, in, the, in the coming uh, time. Uh, in the middle of all this complex patient management, uh, we haven't forgotten that uh, given the complexity of disease, our patients need to be educated more and more about the disease. So, uh, we have uh, an MS Center open house coming up in November, on November 13 at 5.30 to 6.30 p.m. And uh, anybody who's interested is most welcome to attend this open house. To refer a patient or to find out more about the Sturdy MS Center, uh, you can call this number uh, at 7170 from within the hospital or simply call the hospital operator and ask for the MS Center.
So just want to make another pitch for the MS Center open house uh, on November 13th uh, at 5.30. So it will be great to see you there if, if you are interested. So thank you for your time. I'll be happy to take any questions. So gamma globulin is uh, is a therapy that basically uh, provides a patient large doses of a substance called antibodies. Uh, these are usually responsible for fighting infections. And what this medicine is is that they pool the plasma from several donors, like from the blood. They separate the cells that take the plasma. And that has a pool of wide range of antibodies, uh, which then they collect together to produce this high-dose IVIG or intravenous immunoglobulin. The mechanism by which this intravenous immunoglobulin works in MS is that it tends to modulate the immune system. You would think that it would have pro-immune effects because it is actually an antibody. So you're giving an immune uh, substance, an immunological substance to a patient, but when it is given in those high doses, it modulates the immune system in a way that it becomes less active and tends to cause less damage over a period of time. Yes. Can you identify what laboratory tests you find are very useful in helping you to diagnose MS? Yes. So, just a few weeks ago, uh, I had the opportunity to diagnose a patient with Huntington's disease. Huntington's disease, there is a well-defined blood test. You order that test, there is a genetic mutation, you identify it, answer is yes or no, sometimes gray, but usually yes or no. And you say a patient has Huntington's disease or a patient doesn't have Huntington's disease. For MS, there is no such blood test, unfortunately. Uh, therefore, the, the, the process of diagnosis becomes complex, and that's why I said the diagnosis is based on a combination of clinical features as well as now, over the last 15 years, uh, and it is evolving, MRI. Uh, in terms of blood tests, we do get some blood tests, and that they are mainly uh, done to rule out other causes of these presentations. So we want to rule out things like immune diseases, other, other autoimmune diseases, or rheumatological diseases, like SLE, for example. So we want to check for uh, ANA, or anti-nuclear antibody levels. We also check for Sjogren's antibodies to make sure we are not dealing with something in that rheumatological spectrum. Antiphospholipid syndrome can also cause uh, uh, manifestations like that on MRI, sometimes uh, clinical features also. We also want to do uh, some basic labs to make sure we are not dealing with a B12 deficiency or we are not dealing with uh, a patient with uh, Lyme disease. Lyme disease is another possible mimic, which again causes a lot of confusion because uh, uh, a lot of white matter changes in the MRI have been attributed to Lyme disease in the literature, which may or may not be related, but we just want to get it out of our way. You had a slide showing the progression of the disease without treatment. Is there a slide showing the progression of the disease with the treatment? Yeah, so, no, I don't have a slide right now with me. But uh, the thing is that with the, all the available treatments, you tend, we, tend, we are able to slow down the progression. And uh, that the various treatments, they serve to decrease the relapse rate. So if a patient is having two or three relapses a year, may, depending on the response, may not have a relapse for years or may have a dec significant decrease in the relapse rate. And when the relapse rate uh, decreases, the time to progression to a certain level of disability also increases. Uh, the problem starts when patients enter the secondary progressive phase, where the relapses are not the problem, but somehow the neurological function is itself deteriorating. And that is a problem that has not been solved. So there are patients who have been on treatment for 15 to 20 years. They have done relatively well. They would have done worse if they had not been on treatment. 
but uh, now they have entered this so-called secondary progressive phase where they are having a, dec a gradual decline over months to years uh, on which the current therapies are not uh, working that much. So, so that is the problematic phase. And that is thought to be due to the immune system that is resident within the brain itself rather than immune cells coming from outside and attacking the brain or the spinal cord. Uh, the progressive phase is thought to be due to immune cells that are there within the brain itself. And there are no good medications or at least uh, proven or approved medications to attack those resident immune cells. Is there genetic research being done to see what triggers this autoimmune response? Yes, it's a lot of research is being done in genetics. So uh, there have been certain so-called HLA types that have been identified that uh, lead to increased predisposition. And uh, now, <clears throat> at, actually at Brigham, they're doing a very, very uh, sort of comprehensive genome-wide analysis uh, for patients with uh, multiple sclerosis. Some of the genes uh, that have been identified are related to vitamin D metabolism and its effects on the immune system. So for all our patients, we recommend that they take a good amount of vitamin D and at least have normal levels of vitamin D because vitamin D tends to modulate the immune system and has been shown uh, not in you know, well-defined randomized trials but in several uh, retrospective studies to have a favorable effect on the course of uh, multiple sclerosis. So uh, another thing that has recently come up is salt intake and salt in, uh, increased salt intake has been found to be associated with, uh, again, more immune-mediated damage. Uh, so, you know, low salt is good for so many other conditions, so we can just add MS to that list uh, also. Although, again, no prospective large studies have been conducted. But this is, uh, these are some of the insights that have been either identified or supported by the genetic studies, and, and this is an ongoing work. Uh, Patients who have uh, family members or twins, for example, with MS, they are at increased risk. Uh, uh, but even with that, the risk is not 100%. So with, like, for example, for twins, the risk is only 30%. If one twin has uh, uh, MS, the other twin uh, I mean, the risk of having MS is 30%, as opposed to one in 1,000 in the population. But still, it's not 100%, so it's not completely genetic. So it's a combination of genetic and environmental factors. You showed a slide that had um, the white spot turning a little blue, and you said something about the body healing um, or oh. it beginning to heal on its own. Is that um, done by uh, medication that's advancing that healing, or is that the body doing it on its own? And are there drugs that are being developed that will help cure the, the, the problem? Yeah, so that's an excellent question. and. Right now, I think this is the body doing its job. There are no uh, proven medicines that help the body do that particularly. Obviously, when you are uh, trying, you're, you're preventing relapses or you're suppressing the immune system, then body gets time to do that, and that helps it, uh, you know, recover itself. Uh, but there is no tr uh, proved treatment right now that helps the body do that. However. Uh, this is a very active area of research uh, for uh, promoting remyelination. This myelin sheath is the one that is affected, so you want to pr promote remyelination. And uh, uh, several uh, drug companies are actually working actively on uh, several molecules. So these, this myelin is produced by a, another type of cell that's there uh, other than the neuron cells. It's called oligodendrocyte. It's a cell that sends its projections and then myelinates the neurons. And uh, there are certain molecules that you can target towards those cells and promote their process of remyelination. Uh, there is one antibody that uh, is being worked on is anti-lingo-1, lingo, L-I-N-G-O-1 lingo, -I -N -G -O antibody that people are working on. If that happens, that will be actually huge uh, in, in management of MS. And in terms of cure, well, uh, no, we don't have a cure right now. but. Uh, we can manage it, uh, but uh, Dr. Howard Weiner, who is a pioneer in MS uh, and is, uh, is in Boston, he thinks that we will be able to cure it you know, someday, soon, hopefully.
Yes. Are these patients at risk for infection? Uh, with some of the therapies, yes. Uh, there are some of the some of the therapies are very powerful immune suppressants, so uh, they do uh, put patients at increased risk. But again, that's a risk-benefit ratio uh, that one has to consider. And uh, most of the approved uh, therapies are reasonably safe. One of the therapies is an infusion therapy. Uh, it's called natalizumab. It's an antibody that prevents the migration of immune cells from the blood to the brain. Uh, that helps decrease MS relapses significantly, but it also puts the brain at risk for increased infection. And uh, there is a virus that lives, uh, again, in those oligodendrocytes that I mentioned, that may get activated uh, in patients who do not have these external cells coming in their brain uh, for surveillance of any infection. So there are now comprehensive programs to screen which patients are at increased risk for that type of infection. Uh, so we don't, uh, we try to avoid offering that particular medication to that group of patients. So with a blood test, you can identify if they have been exposed to that particular virus in the past. And if that's the case, we want to go to other options. In some cases, we may still decide to do that particular antibody, but then that requires very close monitoring uh, and surveillance for development of anything like that. Uh, and then there's another antibody called rituximab that's used for off-label use in, in MS, uh, and that also puts patients at increased risk of infections like sinusitis, pneumonia, et cetera, uh, and, uh, and not so much with that virus infection that I said in the brain. But that again, that is again. You have to see what are the patient's expectations, and you know what are the uh, how severe the disease is, uh, and you know. So it's not like a life-threatening infection with the with the rituximab usually, if the patient's immune system is otherwise intact. Is one of the reasons for treatment right Yes, it can be in particular situations. So if a patient uh, does not respond to high doses of intravenous steroids during an acute relapse, uh, and you have given enough uh, steroids, but the response is not forthcoming, then one can uh, go to plasmapheresis to exchange the, the, the bad humors that are causing the exacerbation. So in the acute uh, relapse management, it has a role for patients who do not respond to steroids. Uh, I don't think so. I haven't done it yet, so. Give us an example of the most striking results or, uh, from mm -hmm. one of your therapies. Uh, talk about a patient or maybe give an insight into how effective these therapies are. Yeah, so uh, let's see. Okay. Better way to do is this. So the, uh, the therapy landscape started in 1992 with uh, interferons, particularly mm -hmm. this beta-seron, uh, Rebif, Avonix. These are all belong to this category of interferons. Uh, they have been successful in decreasing the relapse rate over years. Over the years, the development of monoclonal antibodies has been the most striking development in the management of MS. So. Uh, I have had patients who have taken these monoclonal antibodies and their brain MRIs were full of contrast-enhancing lesions representing leakage of contrast material. Uh, but after they have been on those infusions for a couple of months, their brains uh, look absolutely very close to normal. It's hard to find, you know, identify where the earlier lesions were. And uh, I mean, obviously, as I said, the stronger the therapy, the stronger, the higher the risk of uh, side effects. So uh, we keep that in mind, but there are patients who have been on these infusions for years, and when you look at their MRI, uh, you say, did they really have MS at that point, at some point? So, uh, but yes, again, that's not a cure, because you know, we haven't, they still have to have the infusions at regular intervals. So uh, I am, you know, very uh, uh, sort of my go-to treatment for patients who do not 
uh, respond to other treatments or who have advanced disease are these infusions with the monoclonal antibodies. Uh, but yes, uh, we have to be careful. They all have their side effects and potential risks. I noticed that you use, you know, from your graph, that you use more often uh, campipap and tisomphy. Uh, no, it's not uh, my use. It's basically the uh, literature values for the relapse rate reduction. No, no. Yeah. We send out a lot of tests for Stratify for patients that are on Tysagri. Right. Uh, what percentage of patients would you say are on Tysagri? Uh, so, well, depends. Uh, in, in our practice so far, I would say fewer than 10%. We try to avoid using a you know, very powerful drug if we can manage with, with other medications because we don't want to expose our patients to unnecessary risk if we can avoid that. Sure. Hi, um, you mentioned that SLT is involved in the MS Center. How, oh, yeah. how often is Asia uh, achieved for patients? About a third of cases. Third to one half. Is so it's a common problem. No, uh, we can uh, usually manage them with maneuvers, chin tuck, and stuff like that, yeah. So the onset in 2020 and 2020, is there any way to screen for it so you can get up before you have symptoms? Yeah, I mean, uh, that's hard always with these diseases because then you have to subject a, a large, um, uh, you know, large population to certain tests that are either expensive, invasive, or inconvenient. Uh, you know, uh, there is no, right now, you know, a, a blood screen that you can just do it at birth, uh, you know, and say, oh, you're, you know, and we don't, maybe we don't want to do that because we don't want to create that anxiety and, you know, uh, uh, all those issues related to that. So, so no, right now screening is not an issue. But yes, if somebody has increased risk factors, like, for example, family history, then yes, you want to just. The only reason I ask is uh, someone in my family, previous 27 symptoms, so they don't have any symptoms, and they have By that time, a lot of them are already progressed, but they feel really infected. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's true, and that happens. Uh, patients who especially have a good lifestyle, I think uh, they're able to you know, uh, avert management, I mean, sorry, expression of symptoms until late. Not that that's a foolproof uh, way of uh, uh, averting symptoms, but uh, I have seen patients who present in their 50s, 60s, and their brains look really bad in, on the MRI, but their symptoms are really not that severe. So in MS, this is a known phenomena, a clinical radiological mismatch. That's why I said the diagnosis and the management is basically a combination of clinical and imaging findings. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, I think we're very fortunate indeed to have Dr. Scott here in the, the MS Center now we're here at Sturdy. In my excitement to introduce him, I forgot to introduce myself. My name is Pat Cochran, and I'm the chair of the Education Committee here. Uh, we're always looking for topics of interest to you, so feel free to uh, let Kathy know if there is a particular topic that you would like us to uh, you know, have presented here. And I want to thank you, uh, Dr. Scott. I'm a lay person and I could understand what you were saying. So I also want to thank Double ACS who is here filming this uh, so that it will be on cable TV. And at this time, I would also like to introduce Dr. Brian Patel. He's the Associate Chief of the Emergency Care Center, and he's going to say a few words for us. Good morning. So um, I was asked basically to come and say a few words, given the current uh, climate with uh, infectious disease and uh, the uh, uh, prevalence of concern for Ebola virus disease, um, we thought it might be prudent to just talk, spend a few minutes talking about the disease and, you know, provide some more information to the community about what the disease is, its transmission, you know, sort of give people an idea of um, some more information about it. I don't have any fancy slides, this is just going to be a brief sort of overview. Um, I know it, 
we kind of went from a situation where there wasn't very much information about the disease to a situation where you're almost on information overload. Um, you get things uh, sent to you via email, on the internet, you know, every day with all different kind of things about the disease. So just as a quick um, overview, um, Ebola virus disease used to be called Ebola hemorrhagic fever. Um, started, or first outbreaks were in Africa, um, started in 1976. So it's actually been a virus that's been around for many, many years, um, but in general has not caused a lot of problems because of the location of where the virus is. The outbreaks that have occurred in the last 40 years tend to occur in very remote areas of Africa where there isn't travel into and out of those communities, so it tended to self-contain itself. Um, and not spread out of that. This last outbreak is a little bit different because it ended up spreading into more metropolitan areas of West Africa, such as Monrovia, which is one of the big cities in Liberia. And then because of the situation in West Africa, um, it led to a much bigger outbreak. So why, did it, why do you have thousands of people dying in Africa if you don't have the same thing in the United States? The biggest reason is resources. So their healthcare system is much more poorly developed than ours. They don't have the resources to have the appropriate PPE or personal protective equipment to protect themselves from the virus, which in the United States we have the benefit of having that throughout the country. Um, they have different cultural practices that we don't have. So their practices of burial of human re remains is very hands-on. You know, it involves a lot of contact with different people and the virus does remain alive in um, the remains of bodies for several days, which is why that also contributed to spread. Um, and then just a the lack of education, you know, how do you get that information out to remote areas of Africa or to parts of Africa where there may not be TV, there may not be internet or anything like that for people to understand, you know, the importance of what's going on. And then also, if you think about it, the transport. So a lot of people in Africa, they don't have access to health care, so what do they do? They take care of their family members in their own homes. So these people are you know, dying in their homes with Ebola virus disease and just spreading the virus everywhere. And people don't really know what to do to prevent it. All of those things in general don't occur in the United States, which is why even with the three cases that occurred in, in Texas, it's managed to self-contain itself because there's been so much awareness, there's been so much involvement with the CDC and the government in terms of quarantining, self-monitoring, and things like that to prevent um, spread of the disease. The disease itself is spread only by contact. So you have to have direct contact with someone that has Ebola virus disease and be in contact with their bodily fluids, whether it be saliva, sweat, vomit, um, diarrhea, um, semen, things like that. But it has to directly contact you and then get into you. So it has to be through a break in your skin or through a, a mucous membrane through the eyes, nose, or mouth. So the idea with the personal protective equipment we use is that it completely covers you from head to toe so that you have no exposed skin to minimize um, exposure to the disease. A couple of the concerns that occurred with what happened in Texas with the two nurses that contracted the disease was protocols in putting on and taking off the PPE. Now putting on the PPE is not that hard, it's already clean, there's not a lot of concern, it's more in taking it off. You have to know how to take it off properly so that as you're taking it off, whatever fluids may be on the gown and gloves doesn't get onto your skin. The, from what I understand, the two nurses there most likely contracted the disease toward the end of this patient's disease process where that's the time where you have the most copious bodily secretions. You have significant vomiting and diarrhea. You have significant diaphoresis or sweating from the fevers. Um, you can get bleeding from the disease as well. And so all of that puts you at much higher risk for contact. Um, and I think given the unfortunate incidents of what happened with that, the country in general um, is much more prepared. We're going through training processes in all the hospitals in the country, including Sturdy, to make sure that everyone knows appropriately how to take on and take off um, personal protective equipment. Um, in terms of the community, you can't get Ebola from water, air, or food. So you're not going to get it by um, eating something that someone else ate. You're not going to get it by being in the same room with someone. Um, you have to be in close contact, which they define as being closer than three feet for a prolonged period of time, and have contact with their bodily fluids. If someone with Ebola virus disease sneezes or coughs and those secretions come out and hit you directly on the face and get into the mucous membranes, yes, you can get it. But it's not like the flu where it kind of hangs out in, in air for a period of time that you can then inhale. Um, it doesn't last that long outside of the body. Um, so you really have to be very, very close. And again, the risk in Massachusetts is almost zero because you can't get it from, unless someone has it. And the only way someone is gonna have it is if they've traveled to West Africa and been in contact with someone who's had Ebola virus disease. So it, you know, it's a very, very difficult disease to get. And while it is the prevalent disease that we're talking about right now because of obviously the concerns with the high mortality um, and you know, everything that's going on, we're also entering influenza season. And influenza is a much more concerning disease from, in the United States from my perspective. It kills many more people than Ebola virus disease ever will. 
Um, and I think, unfortunately, in, the, in talking about it, we've kind of lost sight of, or the media has lost sight of the importance of promoting flu vaccination and you know, hygiene for preventing influenza during the season. Um, so that's my public service announcement for the flu. <laughs> um, and, you know, at Sturdy, we've, you know, continued to, you know, sort of address that issue in terms of the flu as well. Um, so that's basically it. Do you guys have any questions at all about Ebola? Brian, how much training are we doing here at the hospital? So um, we're training all essential personnel that'll have um, immediate contact with the patient in, um, fully in how to take on and take off PPE. We have plans in place that we're starting to educate staff about as well, or have educated staff about as well in terms of how to um, handle a patient should they present to our emergency department. Um, so we've made everyone aware. Thank you.